Okay, so God Save Texas is this trilogy of uh, documentary films, all based in Texas, kind of inspired by Lawrence Wright's book, God Save Texas. And um, he just sort of approached us individually about uh, taking on a subject that seems to be important to both Texas and his premise is, you know, the nation as a whole, you know, te where Texas goes, the nation might follow. And that's a seen in a cautionary kind of way, perhaps. So, My name is Alex Stapleton. And uh, my uh, part in this is I uh, made a, a second installment, which is called The Price of Oil, um, which is uh, all based in my hometown of Houston, Texas. Uh, my name is Ileana Sosa, and my segment is called La Frontera. Um, and it's on my hometown of El Paso and um, the sister city, Ciudad Juarez. My name is Richard Linklater, and my episode is called Hometown Prison, based a, a lot in my uh, one of my two hometowns of Huntsville, Texas. When I lived there mostly in the 70s, they, there wasn't this huge prison boom going on. It was kind of fixed. There were 50,000 incarcerated people. There was... I think 11 units, mostly around Huntsville. It was just sort of, it was a big industry, but it was just there. And there was, you know, tough on crime. It, it became a huge industry. It went from 10 or 11 prisons to like 100 and something over the years. So, but how that's affected Huntsville, I wanted, and just my general attitude toward knowing people, I guess on both sides of the bars and having stepfathers in prison guard. My mom was an activist in the prison. You know, it just, had a big impact on my life, still does, you know, that's, I find myself involved in those issues. And so Larry gave me a chance to kind of explore that. He made it, made it be very personal. I wanted to do a little more of a, you know, I guess information and, you know, documentary, but he kind of, Alex Gibney and Larry and Nell Constantinople are one of our producers. Yes, they really pulled it out of me in some way. So I'm interviewing people, I, guys I went to high school with and people I knew. And, oh, yeah, it was wild kind of going back there and uh, taking, you know, digging into these these issues. And a lot hadn't changed, really. That's the my takeaway. It's only kind of gotten bigger and and maybe a little worse. Um, well, I met Larry, uh, and, and he was, I, I'm from Houston and he was like, this is great because you can really go deep into the oil and gas story. Um, and the more we kind of talked about oil and gas, the more the, the irony and the paradox here is that I, as a black Texan and as a seventh generation Texan, um, my, my family goes all the way back to, to, uh, you know, slavery in, in Galveston and Houston, uh, my ancestors, I was like, what's interesting here is that there's not really this connection with the black community and oil and gas on its face. Um, you know, uh, uh, black and brown people in this state have not really um, been a part of the spindle top boom. And, and you know, there's there's no black oil executives. There's no, when we think of J.R. Ewing, he's a white guy, right? Um, all of the oil exe execs, uh, you know, in, in this country are, are all white. And, um, and it's only been in the past few decades that even, you know, black people, black men in particular, have um, had higher paying jobs, even in the refineries. Um, that was also a challenge just to get those types of, of that type of work. Um, oftentimes, uh, uh, black people uh, historically were given like, you know, trucking jobs, you know, the, the kind of peripheral like uh, uh, work or the most dangerous things to do um, to, to be a part of that world. Um, so, but, you know, going into this, I was a Texan in exile. I had left 20, over 20 years ago. So I, uh, it was all just like new information to me and kind of putting things together and working with Larry to, to kind of formulate what my personal story was going to be. And of course I had watched his episode and had a very high bar to follow. Um, but, uh, but for me, I, I wanted to get into the oil and gas story, but I also wanted to bust the myth of, of what Texas is. I mean, I think that's what's so beautiful about Larry's book is that there's a lot of information in there. Um, there's a lot of factual information in there, but it, because it's semi-autobiographical, it's, um, there's also these just, it's loaded with like these nuanced, like cultural things of, of his complicated relationship with the state. And I was able to kind of like explore that with my film. Um, uh, and, um, I wanted to show 
uh, black culture um, uh, from the state of Texas um, and that we have been there from the beginning. Um, uh, we have been there. We have contributed so much to that state. And um, but our our history and our culture has been erased and, and erased intentionally. And, um, you know, making this film uh, in today's climate with a governor who literally is banning books. The government of, of Texas bans books all the time. Um, this film became one of the most important things that I've done with in my career because it was a way of like putting um, the black story of Texas, just from my perspective, my little tiny part in that, my family's tiny part in that, um, uh, on on film. So it it's about oil and, and energy, but then it kind of has this other parallel lane. Um, and then lastly, it what I realized uh, in making it is that the real story of oil and gas and energy, um, uh, Houston is the energy capital of the United States of America and even the world, um, is that black communities, black and brown communities in the, the city were not really a part of the wealth, but we get the environmental impacts, you know, in, from our, our homes and our communities. And so that was kind of something that, that was a big part of the discovery in, in my process of making the, the film. Growing up on the border in El Paso, I, I, it's, a, it's, a com it's a complicated space and region and um, it's heavily Latino. You know, as soon as you walk into the airport or land in El Paso, you hear Spanish everywhere. And, you know, I thought that was, I didn't think it was necessarily unique to me growing up there until I left. And then I went to Central Texas and studied um, in university near Austin. And El Paso and the border in general is a very unique place and very different from a lot of uh, parts of Texas. Um, you know, I'm first generation Mexican American, and um, I grew up crossing all the time between Juarez and El Paso. And in this episode, we explore what it's like to live in this in-between, um, which I think a lot of people of color relate to. Um, we explore this term, Nepantla, which um, the, it's a Nahuatl word, meaning in-between. What is it like to live in the in-between? Um, and, you know, when you think about the border, people automatically think about the violence, right, that's happened in Juarez, the femicides. Um, and while that history can't be ignored, there's also another complex layer that this is a very interconnected place and people have managed to live everyday lives despite the fence, despite, you know, that's, that physical separation. Um, and we explore that in the episode. We also explore some hidden history about just, um, you know, the, the bath riots. I, people don't really know about that that happened on the border and how a Cyclone B was used, you know, on, on the border to disinfect um, migrants that were crossing, you know, even before the Nazis used it in concentration camps. So, you know, there's a lot of hidden history that people don't think about the border, but it's there, right? And it's part of our history in Texas. And this racism, this classism is something that's just part of the every, everyday fabric. But I also want to point out that there's I think hope and there's people that are on the ground trying to, to, to make Texas a better state for everybody. But at some point, Texas could have more electoral votes than like California and Florida combined. Larry says in his book, 2050. So that's pretty soon, you know, in, a, in the large, large stretch of U.S. history. So it invites the question, yeah, maybe we should pay attention to this state and see where it's going and help it along because we're always at these kind of turning points in elections, you know. Beto gave it hell. He was very close. He almost beat Ted Cruz, you know. The Texas I grew up in, it was Democrat. It was solidly blue, but I realized all those people, they're, they're, they became Republicans. You know, the John Connollys. It's like, oh, yeah, they voted Democrat, but they were quick to, they were like Dixiecrats, I guess. Yes. When we talk about Texas in the news, it's like, you know, tweets or, or you know, um, uh, one sentence about how obnoxious the state is, like something, <laughs> something that stupid something, something stupid we did, we you know, another book, yeah, we made like a law, the worst of the worst, yeah. and it's bad. You know, I'm not con like that. Your that poor, yeah, yeah. He, our attorney general is a criminal. Like there's you know, a lot of like there's a lot of embarrassing, a lot of embarrassing things. things. But it's important for the rest of this country to like to to be a part of you know the the um, the fight for you know basic human rights, basic, you know, uh, humanity, like in our state. Um, and it's, I think that people get turned off because they think that everyone in the state 
you know, that that the people of the state actually believe, you know, and support the government of the state. And I really hope that people can understand that, like, even, you know, with our federal government for a number of years, there were a lot of people that did not, did not agree with the, what the federal government was doing. And I think there's a lot of similarity in what Texas is experiencing right now. And so hopefully we can kind of let people know there's a lot to love about Texas, a lot to love. But um, but we can also be critical. But, you know, like, let's all get together as Americans to to, to help create change there.